All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safer Sim webinar. Today's presentation will feature researchers from the University of Iowa. Chris Schwartz and Wangson Wang will discuss their Safer Sim project, distributed simulation to support driving safety research. Um, so please use the chat box for any questions or comments. There will be time at the end for a discussion um, after the presentation as well. Um, and with that, I will turn the microphone over to Chris and Wangson. Thanks, Jacob. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, my apologies if you were signed up to watch it at the original time and that we had to reschedule it. That was my fault due to a last minute trip. Uh, but I'm glad you're here now. Um, and uh, so we're going to present uh, myself and uh, Matthew um, so work that we did for the Safer Sim project on distributed simulation. And I would also like to acknowledge Dave Heitbrink, um, head software development at um, NADS, for lots of useful discussions and help that he provided throughout the project. <clears throat> at the end, I'll also be able to share with you some of the ongoing work and future work that this project is leading into as well. That's very exciting. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Well, why is it not trading the arrow? Yeah, okay. There we go. So an overview of the project, first motivating some motivating information. Um, it's all about safety in many respects. And of the um, too many fatalities that happen on US roads and highways every year, um, a large percentage of them are two vehicle um, crashes or more. Um, the top five pre-crash scenarios from 2007 um, were things like lead vehicle stopped, vehicle turning at a junction, lead vehicle decelerating. So these are, are obviously critical situations. And we've studied them for many years here at the NADS. But of course, we've had to program one of the vehicles to be controlled by a computer um, and uh, leaving one vehicle to be controlled by a driver. And um, uh, several, several studies now have been done using distributed simulation that have demonstrated that you can get a picture of the of uh, honest interactions between drivers um, if you have multiple drivers in uh, in a simulation. Uh, and sometimes these interactions can be interesting and unexpected. Um, and so we can <clears throat> we can learn things by studying the interactions that we couldn't necessarily learn if uh, with one of the vehicles controlled by a computer. Um, similarly, uh, recent work on connected vehicles has shown that providing connected vehicle warnings is another way to um, to mitigate or prevent these multi-vehicle crashes. Um, and it also creates another opportunity to study interactions between drivers uh, with a warning system. Um, that's a very interesting case because you can't necessarily, you may not even see the other vehicle when the warning is given to you. It could be obstructed by another truck. It could be three cars ahead of you. Um, so it's a very interesting, interesting crash type and um, uh, application for, for what we're doing. So <clears throat> distributed simulation offers a path forward for researchers to study driver interactions um, in simulation. And uh, some of the early research and early study uh, in this area was done way back in 2003 by Hancock and Reuter. Uh, and they were able to show even back then how the driver interactions um, can 
result in these emergent behaviors that are a result of of um, of the of the two drivers interacting. Um, <clears throat> you may know if you follow this field, the military heavily uses distributed simulation for training, uh, and they call it live virtual constructed training. Um, and so it, it gets much more complex than, than what I'm going to be talking about here today. Um, and they've been doing it for a long time. So it's quite sophisticated and quite complicated. Um, but the great thing that's come along in the last decades and years are standards that have simplified the networking and the interoperability of these simulators. Um, networking in the sense of how do you set up a distributed simulation? Do you make it client server or peer to peer? And then interoperability standards like uh, high level architecture and uh, HLA and DIS and TINA and these types of things um, have um, greatly simplified connecting different models across a network. And we'll talk more about the particular solutions that we implemented. So the goals of our project um, were fairly modest, this being the first um, such project that we've undertaken here at NADS. Um, so it really was to take the first necessary steps toward a distributed, distributed simulation capability with NADS simulators. So we had to make uh, fundamental code modifications um, in our simulation environment to support the networking, uh, regardless of what choices we made for topology or for um, interoperability. Um, but we started with a pretty simple peer-to-peer -peer configuration, pure peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning that every simulator ran the same software and every um, node in the network was uh, identical. Um, and we just used some custom in-house protocol rather than, than going with, uh, with uh, HLA or DIS or any of the interoperability standards. So the bottom line here is that we really tried to find the path of least resistance to start making progress on this um, this uh, this great software problem, which you can imagine is a lot of work. Uh, and finally, we demonstrated a scenario, a simple scenario that used the distributed simulation. So I'm going to turn it over to Matthew now, and he's going to talk about some of the technical details. And then he'll turn it back over to me, and I'll wrap up uh, back at a higher level. Um, so uh, Matthew, you want to take it away? Thanks. Thanks to Chris. Um, <clears throat> in technical description, I'm going through the software engineering requirement analysis and design processes. <clears throat> First, let's look at requirement analysis. We are required to enable multiple uh, simulators, multiple drivers to drive in a single scene. And the fact is we have a uh, we have a simulator that enables a single driver driving in a scene. Uh, so the difference is on the number of drivers. And uh, of course, uh, based on the uh, functional expression of, of sin, uh, sin of D and S, uh, we could separate the problem into three domains. Uh, first, the the first domain is sim, uh, stands for simulation, Let's, uh, and the second is uh, driver, the third is sim. Let's look at on the uh, simulation. <coughs> um, what is simulation? We uh, The simulation is to use animation to simulate driving perspective. Animation consists of a series of uh, images that snapshot the state, uh, the uh, the scene objects in smooth state transition, and each image of the states will be called a frame, and the frame is identified by a frame number.
uh, then we look at the um, look at on the domain of drivers and scene. A driver is uh, represented by a vehicle in a simulating environment, and the vehicles could be categorized into two types. The first type is um, EDO, i.e. The, the vehicle is driven by human operator through uh, driving peripheral devices such as the steering wheel and paddle. And <clears throat> the second type is uh, ADO. The, the vehicle is driven by uh, AI programs. Scene uh, is a set of uh, objects, includes static objects and dynamic objects. And um, we use pseudocode to describe the algorithm for updating um, frame n. A subscript n denotes, uh, for example, s uh, sub of n denotes the state of object O in frame n in this formula. And CN uh, denotes the control command for N um, in frame N. Control command for, for EDO and ADO um, is generated differently. Um, for EDO, it is generated by uh, peripheral devices. For ADO, it is generated by AI programs. Uh, the distributed version of um, this algorithm is uh, doing the incremental based on the uh, previous algorithm. Um, and the incremental part is highlighted in red. <clears throat> uh, apparently, distributed version algorithm will involve a uh, network, like broadcast the state information of the object on locally. Um, over to the peers and receive the state information from the peers. A state, <clears throat> the state information of an object includes uh, the uh, the object's orientation, uh, velocity, acceleration, etc. Um, we have four main components. <clears throat> uh, the first one, seven. Uh, it contains all the uh, objects, and it um, it does calculation for ADOs uh, to calculate the state and uh, uh, HCSM executes the. Um, the AI program generates the uh, com uh, command control, um, controlling command to ADOs, and uh, it controls the uh, life cycle of ADO. Next, Dana, it does calculation, um, dynamic calculation for, for, for EDOs based on the input from steering wheel and uh, paddle. Visual server uh, it, visualize, it visualizes the um, the uh, the state the state information of the scene. The relationship <coughs> uh, among the uh, components is that in this diagram, and uh, the, uh, the the blue arrow uh, represent the accessibility. Uh, for example, there is an arrow points from Visual Server to Civit. That means Visual Server can uh, could access Civit. However, Civit is not able to access Visual Server. And the um, uh, the subtasks subtasks um, in the algorithm is distributed into uh, different components. For example, uh, Cog EDO 
is completed in Nesdaina and car ADO is completed in seven. Uh, from the static structure, we, uh, we debit the, the algorithm, the distributed version algorithm in, into a, a workflow. <clears throat> and the incremental part corresponding, um, corresponding to the highlighted part in red in the pseudo code uh, it, uh, is highlighted in the red box. Uh, and uh, those two incremental parts are involved um, involved into network facility. <clears throat> um, the the corresponding dynamic workflow uh, will be um, the incremental two processes will be complete in uh, into a an additional module um, which is highlighted in in red box and that one is accessed by seven and finally um, there the detailed level on the uh, the detailed view uh, on the additional module um, which which is the result of the definition of the interface and classes. Um, the the, uh, the module for IGCOM that uh, that encapsulates the um, the facility of network. Uh, currently, it it is based on a UDP protocol, and a separation of this module will bring us the convenience to upgrade this network facility with more um, simulating a specific protocols network facility that's uh, that's all from me i'm going to hand it over to chris okay thank you matthew um all right so um that in some that was a lot of detail about kind of what we had to dig in and add to our software. Um, the next thing that we did was create a simple scenario to test out the changes. Um, uh, so we had two mini sims set up side by side and we connected them over a dedicated network. Um, and the scenario files that we use are just text files. So everything is specified in uh, a text file and it has a format um, that's uh, unique to ISAT which is a tool that we use to create scenarios so um, the way that we did it for now was we extended the format of the scenario file to include configuration information um, needed to set up however many IP addresses and such were included in the simulation and their names and you know whatever whatever we needed to figure out how many simulators were going to be um, uh, were going to be included in in this distributed scenario. Uh, so all of that was was coded into the scenario files, and then the scenarios were run on each mini sim. Uh, so we started everything at the same time, and this was done in a peer to peer approach. Um, and everything worked fine and we learned a couple of interesting things almost by accident um, we discovered uh, this interesting wonderful technique that we may try to try to keep on as a scenario control approach um, because uh, this is scenario control is one of the huge issues as you look at scenarios for distributed uh, distributed simulations um, when there's only one driver, you can time everything pretty tightly and control um, control it to uh, in in as much detail as you want. Um, but when you have two drivers, they drive at different speeds and they behave unpredictably, 
and even getting them to arrive at the same intersection at generally the same time can be a huge challenge. Um, but with this approach that we that we took, it was fairly simple to put traffic vehicles into the simulation um, and do it in such a way that uh, the traffic vehicle may only appear to one driver. Uh, so you could have a lead vehicle for a driver that to the other driver wouldn't even be there. Uh, and you can use that as sort of a rabbit vehicle to control the speed of the driver and just give the, the participant instructions to follow a lead vehicle. And then this lead vehicle would lead them to the event and have them arrive at generally the time that they need to be there. Um, so that's kind of an interesting approach and uh, one, that we, um, one that we discovered as we were doing this. Beyond that, it was our intent to do a small data collection for this project, but due to lack of time, uh, we kind of ran out of time and schedule to get that done. Uh, so um, the, uh, doing an a actual study will have to wait until a little bit later. Um, and that brings me to ongoing and future work. So for this project, there were some loose ends uh, that we'd like to take care of. One is this stuff we encoded into the scenario files could be done dynamically uh, in um, a simulation lobby of sorts. And if you play networking games, then you kind of know what that lobby is all about. Participants can join the simulation and uh, everybody can, can start together. Um, we, the, making use of a dead reckoning algorithm is a way to compensate for network lags. And uh, having too many sims side by side on a dedicated network meant that we had really no lag um, to speak of. Um, <clears throat> but we have to assume that there will be lag as we begin to put uh, simulators in the network across campus and maybe eventually even farther distances. Um, uh, there are some shortcomings of the peer-to-peer -peer approach that we used that we'd like to um, that we'd like to get away from, uh, and what that essentially means is um, centralizing the HCSM module that manages all the ADOs and other logical elements of the scenario, like traffic lights, um, and basically have all those on kind of a server or, well, a dedicated, um, dedicated node of the network, at least, uh, that can feed the other, uh, all the other simulators. And then finally, we'd like to adopt uh, an interoperability standard, such as DIS or HLA, uh, to make it easier to network things cross-platform uh, with other folks who have you know, taken steps down this path already. Um, so all of those things will um, help us to, to advance our capability here. <clears throat> so one of the things that we've done is investigated some third-party software to kind of help us get to that uh, point. And um, we're making use of uh, VR Link from uh, VT Mock that will uh, help us to... Um, to uh, get all of our objects, object information uh, onto, um, onto a network protocol that uses, supports DIS or HLA, supports several dead reckoning algorithms, and has some other cool features like works with C++, works with Unity. Um, so it should make things pretty straightforward moving ahead in the, um, as we move ahead. So we're probably going to move to something that looks a little bit more like this, where some of the features like the HCSM, which does object management, scenario control, um, onto a central computer. But we will leave other parts like NADSDINA for dynamics, uh, uh, hardware interfaces, of course, for each simulator, terrain interaction and, and visualization, 
on each simulator node. Uh, now it's interesting with this type of a network that could be client server with what they call client side prediction, um, but it could also be peer to peer. It all depends on if you let simulator one talk directly to simulator two or not. Um, so we actually, you know, would still have that choice to make. Um, so we've completed this project, but our work is not done. Um, let me tell you about a few of the things that are going on. A um, couple of projects are going on in parallel over at the Hank Lab at the, on the University of Iowa campus that are very exciting. They're linking together their two pedestrian and bicycle simulators. And they're also going to work to link their um, simulators to a remote driving simulator that's off campus. So those are two very exciting projects. And then we have an FHWA project that is going to um, allow us to network all of our, you know, our, our driving simulators here at NADS to the Hank Lab simulators and do interactions between pedestrians and drivers and bicyclists. And we're also going to try to tackle the very interesting and challenging problem of um, how do you provide for that eye-to-eye -eye contact that can happen between the driver and the pedestrian. And the way that you have to do that is by trying to render the avatar of the participant it, at the other simulator. Um, so we're also teaming with uh, a, another lab called, on campus called the IDEA Lab under Professor Stephen Bake, uh, <clears throat> who's done a lot of avatar rendering like that before. And so we'll do some motion capture and um, send information about pedestrian uh, and driver motions across the network and then render them as the avatars in the other simulator. Uh, so we're really on a, on a great path, I think, to um, develop our distributed simulation capability here on campus at Iowa. And uh, hopefully it'll keep on going beyond that so that we can um, do some more cross-platform integrations with other folks who have distributed simula simulators. And because um, I think the power with that only, the benefits and the power of distributed simulation only grow the more, um, the more, the more uh, you can include in simulation. Although the challenges of scenario control and data analysis will also grow kind of exponentially the more participants that you add. So a lot of great challenges coming up. And um, I think I'll stop here. And we'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, I see Sean already has one. <clears throat> Curious to hear why you decided to put distributed simulation configuration at the scenario versus the simulation network level. Um, well, uh, I think the simplest answer to that question right now, Sean, is that in this project, we always looked for kind of the path of least resistance. And we knew from the beginning that whatever we did here was not going to be the permanent solution because um, it's hard-coded, uh, needs to be done manually. Uh, for every uh, for every uh, every simulation that you create or every scenario that you create uh, and so really the way to do it is to do uh, come up with a program that can work more dynamically allow you to configure um, the simulation at a higher level but we're not quite there yet so this approach was easy easy to do and it didn't take very long um, okay, John asks, will linking two or more simulators change your approach to modeling collisions? That is a great question, and the answer is yes, it will have to. It will have to. Um, interesting thing about driving simulation that uh, kind of took, I would say, several years to really dawn on me completely um, but 
you know, we manipulate things in the simulation sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot. So if we're designing a collision scenario, we can really make it uh, so that everybody will have a collision if we don't do anything to mitigate it or prevent it um, just by making the situation severe enough. Uh, or we can make it so that half the people in general will have a collision and half will be able to avoid it. I mean, that's one of the great things about the level of control that we have with the driving simulator is that we can set up the conditions to be as tight and as severe as we want them to be. And then we can look at the safety benefits, for instance, of a warning system. Now, that whole entire statement that I just made kind of goes out the window when you have two people driving in a scenario. Um, <clears throat> because they're going to behave how they're going to behave. And we can only do so much to set up the, uh, set up the collision situation um, and try to make it happen. In real life, collisions are much more rare, obviously. They only happen a fraction, you know, of when you consider how many miles are traveled and, and how many intersections you drive through, they're really quite, quite rare. And so it will become, I think, a much greater challenge to make those situation, collision situations happen in the way that we want them to happen in a distributed environment. Um, so there's opportunities, but I think there are great challenges there too. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to thank you for participating. Do you have anything more to say, Jacob? Um, no, I guess I will add a, that the presentation will be uploaded online within one to two days after this. So hopefully by the end of the week, we will get this up and online on the Safer Sim website and the YouTube channel for you to come back, um, view again, or to share with any of your colleagues that may be interested. Um, I think that's... All the last. This is the last webinar we have before the holiday and New Year break. And then I know the start of January is busy with TRB, so we'll be back in action with webinars uh, towards the end of January 2018. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who came today um, and wish you all happy holidays and a happy New Year. Thank you.